Happy Sunday, church family. So good to be with you today. We are in the final week of our One at a Time series. It's just been so powerful. We've just been trying to get our minds wrapped around how do we just see people the way that Jesus sees people. And so I want you to know we want to see you. Um, if there's anything we can do for you, uh, please text the word. Connect to 733-733. Would love to hear some of your One at a Time stories. Chat with us on just right below. Chat. Would love to hear some One at a Time stories. Um, you all know that the way that we're trying to share stories and get people just to stop scrolling through news, but to start scrolling through some stories that would remind us of how we can love people is the one at a time app. And so make sure you grab the app, share your story. And really, literally right now, what we'd like to do is send it to Sarah Rodriguez, who has a one at a time story at the Indiana campus. Hi, Matt. Um, like you said, I'm here at the Indiana campus. And I don't know if any of you watching know this, but Indiana was our very first campus. Um, and now it's one of 14. So how incredible to see how God has expanded us throughout the region in the last like couple years. But um, today I am here with my new friend, Brittany, and Hi. she is going to tell us a little bit about how she accepted the one at a time challenge. So we uh, come to church here on Thursday evenings. And so we were coming up to the stoplight. Um, to get off the interstate and there was a man standing at the side of the road um, and usually I don't roll my window down or do anything like that um, but I felt the Holy Spirit tug up my heart mm -hmm. and so I roll my window down and I take all the change that was on my dashboard and mm -hmm. I give it to this man and my five-year-old from the back seat goes mommy why did you give that man all your money and I said well I said uh, son I said you never really know what someone's going through yeah I said and so to be able to Touch that man's life um, is just great. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool how you listened to the Holy Spirit and you were able to love the person in front of you who who knows how that touched him. And we just pray that that would make an even bigger impact than what it looked like for not just for him, but for your son and for anyone that you all come in contact with. And so right now we um, are going to go back to Blanket Maker. Where worship's about to start. I love that story, uh, whether it is the money off your dashboard or I've literally even heard somebody giving away a truck. The point is, can we see people the way Jesus sees people? And so Mark Moore is here, excited about the service today. Prepare your heart, get ready. It's going to be a good one. Let's head into worship.
we don't earn, that we can't possibly deserve, but a love that chases and fights for us and pursues us one at a time. Let's sing this out. Let's praise our Father. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. And you have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your
can grab a seat. So good. Mm. Well, it was Thursday night. We have our Thursday night service and it's about three o'clock and um, had to go home real fast because my wife had a list of a couple things that needed to be done before I made it to church. We had some stuff going on. That's all you need to know. And as I was headed home, um, I got this phone call from my wife or from the church and the church said, hey, Mark Moore, the guy that's uh, gonna be here this weekend, uh, he missed his flight. You're probably gonna be preaching tonight. I was like, oh, okay. A couple hours, normally takes a couple weeks. It's fine, it's gonna be fun. So, uh, so I headed home, but I'm like, okay, I gotta get this done for my wife. Like I made a promise, right? And so, you know how fellas, you know how there's like a long way to do th things and then there's a short way and you're like, surely the short way is gonna work. Well, the short way ended up with my truck and trailer stuck in the mud in the back of my yard. Stuck, stuck. And as I sat there with a stuck truck, um, I then, so sermon, truck, okay. So I look out the, the window of, of our truck and um, my third son, his name's Levi, um, we built this chicken coop together. He wanted to do chickens and he's raised them since the time they were little and he's, he's great with them and all that kind of stuff. And I looked out and the door, I could tell the door had been left open and there were a couple chicken bodies in the yard. And I was like, come on, Lord, like, what are we doing right now, man? Like. I got, I got, not now, none of this, not now. And um, just then I, I turn and I kind of see uh, the car pulling in the driveway and, and uh, my son's about to find out and I'm stuck and I got a sermon to write. And you ever have one of those moments where you're like, which is more important? And so I just felt like the Lord just said, dude, get out of your truck and go be there for your boy. So I got out of my truck I like, you know, look back and I was like, why am I so dumb? And I just walked over to the chicken coop. My, I met my son there and we just had our dad moment. And it was in that moment, and, and why are you even hearing about this? Because it just made me think of what we've been talking about this whole time. And I, and I just thought, God, I, here's what I thought. I literally got the, got, you know, Father, I'm so glad that you're not a God that says, I love you, but. Yeah, man, I love you, but I'm real busy right now, man. Like, I love you, but there's so much going on in the universe right now. And Matt, I love you, but if there are a couple chickens. Can't you just get over that? I mean, that's not a big deal to everybody. But that's not who he is. Our God is an, he's not an I love you, but he's an I love you. And uh, yeah, I know there's a lot going on, but I'm here right now. I love you and I'm available if you wanna talk. Man, I love you, and I know that those chickens may not seem like a big deal to anybody else, but they matter to you. You have my eyes, you have my face, you have me. Our God is a one at a time. I love you and God. So you need to know the truck got unstuck. Mark made his flight with 15 minutes to spare. I didn't have to preach, no worries. I didn't resurrect the chickens, I'm sorry. There's only so much a guy can do. <laughs> but what a powerful thing, family, what we hold in our hands right now as we take communion is 100% evidence that our God is a God who loves you and, and he laid down his life for you because he has eyes for you. He always sees the one. Let's take communion together.
Hey, church family, this weekend we're wrapping up our One at a Time series, but I hope you figured out by now that this is a lot more than a series for us as a church. Like, we want to unleash the full force of the church to love people one at a time. I believe that is how revival is gonna come to our community, to our country, and to the world when followers of Jesus live the way that Jesus lived and love the way that Jesus loved. One of the tools that we want to make sure you're aware of is an app, a new app called One at a Time. If you haven't downloaded the One at a Time app, you can go ahead and do that now. We'll even let you do it in church. Make sure you get connected to this app. It's a great place uh, to be focused on the life of Jesus and a great place to share stories that I know will inspire other people to live one at a time. So make sure you download the One at a Time app. This weekend, we are so glad to have Mark Moore here preaching for us as we wrap up this series. Mark was a professor of mine in college. I remember at age 18, sitting down for a class uh, in college called The Life of Christ. And it's the first time I heard Mark teach on The Life of Christ. I don't know of anyone who knows more about the life of Jesus than he does, but he has always challenged me to not just know about the life of Christ, but to live the life of Christ. I know he's gonna challenge you with that today. He has a new book called Quest 52 that will take you on a journey through the life of Jesus. I hope you'll check that out. Would you please welcome Mark Moore? Thank you. So, so great to be back with y'all. Uh, I want to tell you a story about Everett Swanson. It was 1952. He flew from Chicago, Illinois to Korea. Now, some of you history buffs will recognize that's the height of the Korean War. And he was going there because he was a preacher. He was preaching to the troops who knew nothing about Jesus. So he's excited, middle of winter, it's, it's really cold. And he gets into the house where he's gonna be staying and he lays his coat down. And there was a little kid, like a little local hooligan that grabbed his winter jacket and just bolted, just ran out the door. Now, he was, he was a preacher, but he's also from Chicago, so he knew about crime and he just gave chase. He's an adult, so he's got longer legs. He should be able to catch the kid, but the kid is a little urchin in the city. It's kind of like a scene from Disney's Aladdin. You know, he's going through nooks and crannies, and he was having trouble catching him, but he's, he's like on his heels. The kid rounded a corner, and he said, I got him. He turned the corner, and the kid had just vanished. Now, his coat was laying right there on the ground. And he's looking for this kid, and nowhere to be found. He picks up the coat. And there's a child underneath his coat. He started looking around and there were rags and tattered blankets everywhere and they all had children underneath them. He had run onto a, a hovel of an orphanage. These were all children whose parents had died in the Korean War. And he just felt horrible. So he gets some soup and brings some soup back and feeds the children the soup. But all that night, he, he couldn't sleep. He said, what are we gonna do with these children? And he went, as soon as the saint came up, he goes back there to check on the kids. Well, there were army soldiers there. They weren't harassing the kids, they were actually checking on the kids to see which of them had survived the night. And those that didn't, they loaded on a truck and carted away. And Everett said, like, what am I gonna do? All the way home, the airplane, the engines droned over and over, it sounded like this to him, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? He didn't know. So he goes to a friend of his who's a businessman and he told him the story. And then this businessman opened the top drawer of his desk. He had a check in there for $1,000. It wasn't made out to anyone. Years before, the Holy Spirit said to him, you are going to take care of widows and orphans. That's what you're gonna do. And when someone tells you about a need, you can fill it. So he took the check and he wrote, Everett's name on it, and he handed it to him. And that was the beginning of what we now know as Compassion International. A great organization. I'm not talking about Compassion International. I'm just talking about Compassion, period. And in Kyle's book, which I think is a, is a fantastic book, we get to chapter four. The title of chapter four is the same as the title of this message, The Power of And. Here's the problem with compassion. It often sits inside of us, but until it comes out in an act, it really doesn't change anything. 
So I want to talk about the power of and by giving you a little bit of biblical background of this word compassion. In the Bible, the Greek word is fun to say, splankna. If you're online, you can join with me or even on our campuses. Say it out loud if you want, splankna. It's a great word, literally translated, it is <laughs> bowels. Some of you remember the old King James, bowels of compassion, that's where it comes from. And it actually makes sense because when you feel, you don't feel in your heart. It's right here, right? You get sick to your stomach. Your, your stomach goes into your throat or, or you just, there's a pit in your stomach. So, guys, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. I'm just gonna make a simple suggestion that you talk biblically to your sweetheart. And every time you wanna say the word heart, just say bowels. <laughs> oh baby, I love you with all my bowels. <laughs> Honey, you just, you just fill my bowels. I know it's not as romantic, but it is more biblical because here's where we feel it. Now, there's something interesting about this word. In all of Greek literature, it's a noun, it's a noun. It's what you feel, it's what you have. Jesus is the only one in all of Greek literature who turned it into a verb. And he did it all the time. And here's what is so extraordinary about that to me. Jesus didn't just have compassion, he showed compassion. And that is the power of the and. Now, if you've been following along with this book, and by the way, don't tell Kyle this, give him a big head, but I'm really envious of his major observation here because I'm looking at this going, I taught for over 20 years the life of God. I should have come up with this, and he did. But <laughs> the idea that Jesus didn't change the world through crowds, he changed the world one at a time. And so I, I thought, well, does that apply to compassion? And some of you are like biblical experts. You know, Jesus did have compassion on crowds. He did, three times to be specific. But every time Jesus had compassion on the crowds, sometimes he would feed them, sometimes he would teach them. But every time, the story always ends like this. I'm gonna read you one verse, but trust me, it applies to all three incidences. Something like this is said, Matthew 14, uh, 22. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. The end of crowd compassion is dismissal. And that's important to us because we're a crowd compassion culture. When we wanna show compassion, what do we do? We wear a ribbon. Yeah, that'll change the world. Or we post something on social because I saw this news post and it made me so angry for this group of people. Yeah, use social posture and show how righteous you are, but it didn't change anything. Some of you will even write your congressman and we need a new policy for this. And you might be right and it might be helpful, but it doesn't change the world. The world is changed one at a time. And so what I wanna do is just talk to you about the one of a kind, one at a time change, where you take compassion from in here and put it out there, where you move compassion from your bowels to your palm. Now we're talking about change. And Jesus introduced this idea to me through a kid named Billy, to be honest with you. Billy was hands down the single most irritating student I ever had. Don't judge me, you've had those two. Billy was, like he was obnoxious and socially like unaware and every time he raised his hands, the whole class rolled their eyes. I have a front row seat to this and at roll, beginning of the class, and he took me for like five classes, it was irritating. He would say, I would call his name and, and he always had something different and clever to say. And one day, Billy was not in a seat, and I thought, uh, don't judge me. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I called his name, and I relished in that sweet silence, except he answered. He was hiding under my desk. <laughs> I came on court. Billy, get out from under, this is a college class, not a middle grade, get in your seat and shut up. I wasn't proud of my moment. 
He did deserve it, but I wasn't proud of it. His eyes were really like huge. He thought I was gonna throat punch him or something. And even while I'm lecturing, the Holy Spirit won't leave me alone. He goes, that one right. You don't even know Billy. And I said to the Holy Spirit, while I'm lecturing, I know, and I plan to keep it that way. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said, oh no, you need to take him to lunch. And I thought, oh no. Because I've tried to argue with the Holy Spirit, you lose, and I'm just like, oh, man. So after class, Billy, I need to talk to you. And he's like, I said, you wanna go to lunch? And then he went like straight into puppy dog mode. Yeah, 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 let's go to lunch. <clears throat> I asked him one question. Billy, what's your story? Two hours later, I'm a mess. Because if I had been through half of what Billy had been through, I wouldn't be half the man that Billy is. And from that incident, the Holy Spirit gave me, it's kind of an axiom of life, and I wanna, I wanna offload it to you, so all of you Instagrammers and tweeters and whatever memers you do, get your phone out right now because this is gonna go viral. <laughs> this is the life lesson that I learned that people who are unlovely are not unlovely because they're unlovable, but because they're unloved. Haven't you found that to be true? And if you have compassion for the crowds, you will never get to this because you'll never learn the story that changes your view. It is their story that takes, takes you from compassion as a noun to compassion as a verb, to move from what you have to what you give, to move compassion from your bowels to the palms of your hand. That's where life change is. And so I just, I just wanna make an observation of the difference between how Jesus had compassion on crowds and how Jesus had compassion on individuals. And here's the difference. When you have compassion on the crowds, you dismiss them. When Jesus had compassion on individuals, every time he touched them. And there were four specific individuals in the Gospels that it says Jesus had compassion on them. Kyle told the story about the widow whose son had died, and now, you know, now she's a widow and her only son has died, and he raised uh, the, the woman's son. I'm not going to tell that story because, <laughs> let's just be honest, I'm not going to out Kyle Kyle. So I'm going to do a different story. The other options are a leper, two blind men, and a father with a demonized child. What, if you put those all into a category, what would your, catab what would your category be called? Maybe sick, maybe disenfranchised. You know what the category is that the Jews gave it? Not sick, sinner. You say, well, that's kind of cruel. Some guy's blind and you go, well, you're blind because you clearly sinned and God has struck you with blindness. They literally said that, John 9, fact check me. How cruel is it to call someone who is disabled a sinner? And yet, we can judge them back there for what they did, but we do the same thing. Some of you were old enough to remember the onset of HIV AIDS in the 90s. You remember what was said from pulpits? Well, they have HIV AIDS because they're, they're drug users and they're sexually immoral. You, you may not be wrong, but you're certainly not right. I do the same thing even today. I'm embarrassed to admit this, but... This is one of my struggles. I'll drive by and see a homeless person. Say, oh, they're probably a drug addict. Or they, what did they do to get in that situation? I may not be wrong, but I'm certainly not right. I live in Arizona where 48% of the illegal immigrants come through our border. I have a front row seat to how they're treated and how they're talked about. I know. We take these people in the category of sick and we call them sinners. And until you change your perspective on, on, on what category they belong in, it's going to be impossible for you to move compassion from your bowels to the palms of your hand. And so here's a rule. If you want to be a Jesus follower in compassion, here's number one rule. I'm going to give you four before we're done. But here's the number one rule of compassion. The Jesus path to compassion, rule number one, it's harder to like people who are unlike you. 
Do you find that true? If someone has your education level, or your economic level, or your ethnic background, or your religious culture, it's easy to like those people because they're like you. But when they're unlike you, it's more difficult to like people who are unlike you. No, look, it doesn't make you a bad person, it just makes you, well, human. We all do that. But if we're gonna follow Jesus' path, we have to learn to hear the Billy stories behind the scene, to see them how God sees them, not how we see them. And so here's the story that I've chosen. It's, it's about a leper, and it's from Mark chapter one. I'm gonna begin reading in verse 40. A leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Well, okay, there's a lot to unpack there, because first of all, leprosy is nasty. Let's not sanitize it, it's nasty. And the kind of leprosy we have today is different than the leprosy in the Bible in that their leprosy was far more contagious. It could get into leather. It could get into the plaster walls of your home. It, you could spread it by like being near someone or touching someone. So lepers were untouchables. We, we don't have anything in our culture like that that you know, spreads and infects and This blows my mind. The rabbis of Jesus' day actually made a rule of how far a leper had to socially distance. You wanna guess how far it is? This, is? this is in the rabbinic text. It's four cubits, which is 18 inches, which is six feet. Some things never change. This guy was supposed to socially distance six feet, but he doesn't. He runs up to Jesus, like skids on his knees right below Jesus and says, if you're willing, you can make me clean, which I have no clue why he thought Jesus could do that. Well, you go, well, Jesus, son of God. Well, he didn't know that. This guy is asking Jesus to cure leprosy when historically, look through the Bible, no one was cured of leprosy except by God alone. His faith is off the charts. And in that moment, <laughs> you should have been there, it's hilarious. The, the apostles are like backing up going, no, no, no. And, but they know Jesus, he just touches everyone with compassion. And he has compassion on them, they see it in his eyes and they know it's gonna move from his belly to his palm and he starts to reach out and in this slow motion moment, Peter's going, no. Here's the way the Bible puts it. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And in that moment, for the first time in human history, now when a preacher says that, you go, oh yeah, you know, kind of stretching the truth. No, as a historian, I'm saying, for the first time in human history, Jesus made and taught this assumption. Here it is, the step number two for you. Jesus assumed that cleanness was more contagious than uncleanness. That's huge. That changes everything. Because the people that you have avoided because they're unclean, you're assuming that their uncleanness will rub off on you. And Jesus assumes that your cleanness will rub off on them. I learned that at 16 years old. Our youth group went to Mexico every year to serve uh, on mission trips, Ensenada, Tijuana. And one year in Ensenada, we went to a city dump because that's where people were living. And there were all these children running around. Every one of the kids had shaved heads. Anyone know why? Head lice. When I was 16, I had hair down below my shoulders. I'm not gonna lie, I was gorgeous. <laughs> and all these kids had urine stains all over them because they lived in a dump and it already smelled like, you know. And this one little kid is tugging on my pants and he kept saying this word, appa, appa. Well, my Spanish is pretty pathetic and I didn't know what he's saying and the missionary said, he wants you to give him a piggyback ride. Okay, think through the mechanics of that. 
And the Holy Spirit leaned in and said to me, Appa. And I said, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. You ever argue with the Spirit? (laughs) You're going to lose. He doesn't even need to shout. He just whispers loudly, Appa, uh uh-uh, Appa, uh uh-uh, Appa. (laughs) <laughs> this is so dumb. I actually said this to the Holy Spirit. All right, but if I die, it's your fault. <laughs> so I took this kid, I put him on my shoulders, and within two seconds, two things happened that were miraculous. Every kid in the youth group is watching me to see what I would do. Within two seconds, every kid had at least one kid on their shoulders. The other thing that happened was really more more important to me. Remember how Jesus touched the leper and cleanness was more contagious than uncleanness? That's what happened. I am not saying I made him clean. He made me clean. Because I found that sometimes Jesus hides behind the mask of a child with lice in Mexico. And sometimes he hides behind the mask of a homeless person in Louisville. Sometimes he hides behind the mask of an ex-convict. And if you truly want to see Jesus, there is no other way but to move your compassion from your bowels to your palms, to touch the people that he would touch if he were here. And what Jesus does next is really, is, is, is quite extraordinary. The power of touch, we, We're just now learning about this power of touch. Back in the 70s, maybe you've you've heard this before, but there's a lot of countries that don't have incubators. And premature children in those countries in the 70s had a 70% mortality rate. But there's one physician from Australia that said, he invented something called kangaroo care, where you take a premature baby and you put it on the mother's chest instantly, skin to skin contact. That action alone, the the power of touch, took the mortality rate of premature babies from 70% to 30%. Isn't that amazing? We're still learning. Uh, 2008, 2009 NBA season. University of Berkeley studied the touch of every player from every team at every game. Every high five, every fist bump, every attaboy, they tracked it all. And what they discovered was that the teams that had the highest touch in the first half of the season had the best records in the second half of the season. Power of touch. I want to tell you one more story about the power of touch. For Ehab Taha, he's just a normal guy. He was riding the Sky Train in the Bay Area, San Francisco, and he witnessed a man get on the train, like blitzed out of his mind. He was a drug addict. Six foot five, looks like a skinhead. Everyone was terrified of this guy. Well, it probably should have been. He was loud. He was, he, he was yelling at people. He was cussing at people. He was making no sense, really erratic. And a 71-year-old woman, when everyone else was backing away, she went up and grabbed his hand. Tight, wouldn't let go, until he calmed down. And Ehab took a picture of this man on that sky train, and this is what it looks like. When you touch someone. As they get off the, the train, Ehab asked this woman, why, why, why did you do this? She said, I'm a mother. Sometimes children just need to be touched. You're a Christian. Sometimes your neighbors just need to be touched. Sometimes the people who are most unlike you, most need you to engage with them in the name of Jesus. And I think what you're gonna discover is that you'll see Jesus. So what Jesus does next may not make much sense to you. Let me just read it. Uh, Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. And you say, well, see, he sent him away too, like the crowds. Mm, It's different. He sent him to the priest. Why? 
because the priest and the priest alone had the power to declare him clean. If he's not declared clean by the priest, he can't go home. He can't embrace his wife. He can't hold his children. He can't attend synagogue. And then what Jesus is doing is first order of business. Don't go talk about this with everybody. Run straight to a priest. You get uh, declared clean. You are clean. Now get declared clean because somebody needs to hear this on one of our campuses right now. Maybe you're online trying to figure out if I even want to go to that church. Here's what you need to know. We're not just calling you to a touch. We're calling you to a community. And on all of our campuses, we have these groups that meet all over the place in all kinds of shapes and sizes. There is one near you and there is one for you. We're not calling you to, like this is not benevolence. We're not just handing out a 20 to somebody who needs groceries and walking away. We are touching people in a way that would include them in a community. And this is, that, that is actually lesson number three of the Jesus way of compassion, that compassion is connection. And if we're just throwing money at people, that's not gonna change anything. It's when we become a church that is inclusive to bring into connection of the community those who are the least and the lost, those who are up and outers, those who are down and outers. And then verse 45, this is <laughs> probably what I would do. He went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news. He did the exact thing that Jesus told him not to do. <laughs> so Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. Well, that's a bummer. But he was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. You know that's gonna happen. Here's the point, and this is step number four. Compassion costs. And if you're not paying the price of compassion, it's still a noun in your gut, not a verb in your hands. It's gonna cost you. And, and last week, you know, you got the envelopes and we have all these stories that are coming in. But now it's time, we're not gonna give you an envelope, we're just gonna give you a challenge. As we conclude this series one at a time, it's not a moment, this is a movement. And 50 years from now, just like people talk about Compassion International, this is when it started, 50 years from now, some of you are gonna be telling stories to your grandchildren that are yet unborn. This is when it started. This is when our church became this movement in our city. And it's already well on its way. I, I, I really love the story of Sherry. She was sitting in church right next to her best friend. She opened her envelope last week and it was a $20 bill in it. And, and the Lord just put on, her, put on her, her heart the name of her friend sitting right next to her. And it was a little bit awkward, but she says, this is for you. And her friend says, no, no, no. And she goes, no, God bless you. No, 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 God bless you. <laughs> she took it. And when they got out the doors, her friend told her, you know, I'm short on my water bill this month. You know how much she was short? 20 bucks. You know when it was due? The very next day. One of my favorite stories was uh, Katie. Katie shops at the dollar store. Who doesn't? And she was walking out with, uh, six, her bill was $16. That's a lot of stuff. And she was laughing with the cashier about, man, I know we get a lot of stuff at the dollar store, but I still spend a lot of money at the dollar store. And the cashier said, yeah, tell me about it. She said, my husband told me, I don't even know why you took that job because all the money you make at the dollar store, you spend at the dollar store. And then she realized she was speaking of her husband in the present tense. And she said to Katie, oh, well, actually my husband just died. New Year's Day, he died. And Katie thought, you know, Valentine's Day is coming and she's not getting flowers this year. Oh, but she is. Because tomorrow, Katie is gonna take the 20, buy some flowers, and give it to her friend at the dollar store. Probably my favorite story uh, is Melissa. She doesn't come to one of the campuses. She watches online. Melissa, if you're out there, greetings. And so she didn't get an envelope. She didn't get any money. 
But while she's waiting for church to get started, you know, you scroll through Facebook, and one of the, one of the conversations was with a woman who said, hey, does anybody know uh, like some meals that you can buy for $5 that will really spread? Like, it will go a long way. $5 was all she had. And she said, to, she said to Melissa, I can go a couple days without eating, but my daughter can't. So Melissa private message, messaged her and said, listen, let, let me Venmo you 20 bucks. And she did. That didn't come from the church. That came from the church. It's time for you to open your wallet. In fact, I am so moved by this that I'm gonna open my own wallet and I'm gonna to contribute to this movement that will last for decades because there is nothing more influential than a one-at-a-time life. So my challenge is really, is really very clear. You need to open your wallet. You need to download the app. You need to share your story. This is going to change our city for Jesus Christ. And my guess is it will change you too. Holy Father, we want desperately for Jesus to be famous in our city. And we know that there is no power greater than the power of a one at a time life where people just engage in the name of Jesus for the good of God. We know this church has had such an influence for decades. We're, we're ready to, to put fuel on that fire and allow your spirit to do something more unbelievable and more influential and broader and bigger and deeper and wider than we could even think or imagine. So we're asking to this prayer for a simple yes that our compassion would have the and of action. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So family, that's it. And one of the things that Mark said, and I just wanna make sure that you know this, um, this has been a great series, but if you can't tell, this is more than a series. Uh, we just wanna figure out how to see people the way Jesus sees people, family. And we wanna move it from here to like our fingertips um, where God can really move. And so um, I just wanna say this, because I know there's a lot of people in the room, some of them I met for the very first time that have been coming for a week, or they're like literally, I met some first timers here, met some people that have been coming for a little bit, and maybe you got reached out to. And I just wanna say this, some of you are like, man, this is awesome, I love that this church is the kind of church and they wanna see people, but in your heart you're like, but I haven't even been found by him yet. We just, we just wanna say this. Um, number one, you're in a group where, hey, that's all of our stories. All of us had to be found by Jesus. And uh, what we would love to do for you is we would love to help you figure out what that looks like. So maybe after the service is turning to the person who brought you and saying, hey, man, I really, I really feel like I need to figure out this Jesus thing. I feel like I'm the one that needs found. They will help you. If, if you're that person you need help, come on to the next step room, we'll help you. Uh, for if you came on your own or you just feel like uh, you're not sure who to reach out to, I hope that you know to my right, your left, always, anytime, there's a way that we can help you take your next step towards following Jesus. We'd just love to do that. So uh, family, we're just gonna continue to lift our eyes and ask God to just continue to have his way so that we can see people the way Jesus sees people. Let's worship together. Beside you, oh. 
glad that you all were able to worship with us this morning. We're so blessed to be able to get to do this online with you all. And um, it's been so sweet to hear Mark Moore preach this morning. But don't worry, we're not finished hearing from him yet. We're going to hear from him and Matt Reagan in just a minute. Um, but before we do that, if you have any questions um, about your relationship with Jesus, or if you would like to pray with someone or just need someone to talk to, would you text the word CONNECT to 733-733? And let's go to Matt and Mark. Well, hey, family, uh, good to spend time with you. With me is my good friend. And when I say that, I really mean good friend. I've, I've known this guy since I was like 21 years old. Yeah, yeah, and you, you still look just as good. <laughs> That's not true. So, um, Mark, thanks so much, brother. Great challenge. Thanks. Uh, super clear. And, um, and it's been a real gift, and it's been fun for me, and I know Kyle would say the same thing, to have you come in on such an important series for us. And I love it. was a gift. So thanks for doing that. I love it. And it's not lost on me that Kyle allowed me to close a series series. Big deal. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you online for being part of this. And uh, online, um, I'm, I'm at a, ch a church in Arizona, similar size. And online, we've just begun to realize the power of online for people who either can't, uh, physical, or for, for a lot of you, this is like the, the front porch. Yeah. And, and you kind of want to get on the front porch and look in the living room to see if people are weird. I promise you, they are. <laughs> and you belong. Yeah. Co come on to one of our campuses if you can. Yeah, we're all a little weird, family. So, um, so Mark, here's what I want to do with our time. A couple things. I, I want to start off with, give me like <laughs> one extra thing. You're, you know, you've got an online audience. Yep. You can speak a little more directly. Yep. Um, the message has been brewing for a while. Give me that one other thing. And then we'll kind of, then I want to grab some other things. But give me that one yeah. thing, that little extra piece. You well, know? for the one thing, let me just talk to one person. Um, Melissa, I told your story. Man, I, I, I think what you did for our whole church is huge because you opened your wallet before anybody else did. And that's the one thing for me that I would love to have had a little bit more time to talk about. And honestly, I can't, I can't, can't do it on stage in front of people because they would look like, look at me, how generous I am. It's not, it's not generosity. Here's the backstory. I did a service project in, in Phoenix where I lived and I just paid for the supplies. It was $900 for the supplies. And then this dude in our church, he goes, no, no, you, that was, your contribution was time. So I'm giving you your money back. And I thought, no, it's God's money. So now I'm trying to give it away again. So <laughs> Melissa, I have a gift for you and we're gonna reach out to you and find you because I trust you. I don't live here. I can't do the one at a time, one-on-one -on -one here. I'll do it in Phoenix but I wanna give you a gift because I trust you to do again what you've already proved you're capable of doing. I love that, love that. Well, Melissa, we love you. Uh, thanks for being a powerful example. Um, really appreciate that. So Mark, one of the things that you've made an impression on me, and this is true, is not just in sermons, and I've heard a lot of your sermons, you know that I have. Yeah. Uh, but on top of that, it's been your passion for Jesus. You taught Life of Christ yeah. for how many years? 22 years. 22 years of teaching Life of Christ. And one, another thing I'm grateful for, so for example, I have a, you know, I have a group of uh, high school boys that meet in my house every week. And yeah, for the last year awesome. and a half, uh, two years now, somewhere like that, you know, there's just a bunch of big ogre boys. I mean, they're just huge. One of them yeah. bench presses 400 pounds. Anyways, wow. he's a massive human being. Um, but I'm just telling you this, uh, one of the things we're starting next week is the book that you wrote earlier, which is Core 52, right. which is 52 passages of scripture yeah. that just give you a more holistic picture. Um, but I have to be honest, I love that, but I got the really quest. excited quest. about your latest book, Quest 52. Yeah. Tell, tell them why I'm so excited about yeah. it. Yeah. So Quest 52, 52 weeks a year, there's one lesson a week with application for every day. I want Jesus to be personal to you. Yeah. I don't want him to be a flannel graph Jesus. I want him to be like first name basis. You can talk to him, you can walk with him warning he is more terrifying than you think mm. and when I first wrote the book I felt like I was in the front of the boat when the storm came Jesus calmed the storm like they woke Jesus up so he would bail out the boat mm. and most of the time we go to Jesus say, bail out the boat bail out the boat and he goes no you don't understand mm. I'm Lord of the sea <laughs> and he calmed the sea and the disciples were so afraid they huddled in the front of the boat and said who is this man I want you in your quest for Christ mm. to come to the conclusion, I don't even know a, 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 a millionth of how great he is. Mm. I can't take you to Jesus, but 
I hope, I hope as a teacher I can point the way he wants to be found. Yeah, it's so good. He wants to be found. He wants to be found. And so um, I, I just want you to know uh, he can be found. And yeah. uh, if you, know, you know our heart around here. We want you to really know the real Jesus. There's yeah. a lot of fake pictures out there of who he is. We want you to know the, the real one. And so, Mark, thanks so much for your time, man. Just love you. Um, pray that if, you, if you're looking for a resource, I'm telling you, that Quest 52, powerful. Core 52, powerful. Um, he's got a third one coming up. We won't tell you about that later, but we've talked about it. I'm excited about it. Um, but we want you, I want you to know this. Coming up, March 1st, speaking of digging into Scripture, March 1st is your opportunity as an online community to really start a group. Maybe you've been thinking about it. You're like, you know what? I'm sitting here anyways. I'm already watching this all the time. I really should. You even talked about groups in your sermon this morning. Until, until you're really brought back into community, I love what you said, we might have cured you, but we haven't healed you. Yeah. And so an opportunity to really get into community is coming up for you. March 1st, we'd love to have you dive in. But other than that, family, we just love you. Hey, I'm, can I can I sign off the way I always sign off my yeah, sermons please, at my please, own church? Please. Hey, family, let's go out and make Jesus famous.